companion. You love the man. I do not understand. Is he important to you? More important than anything. Is he... as though he were a part of you? He is part of me. The man must continue. He will not continue. He will cease to exist. He does not age. He remains forever. You speak of his body. I speak of his spirit. I do not understand. Drawing is slow and it's presencing. Almost as if it asks the viewer to pause, to think and breathe. I think of the combination of time, breath and elongated thinking as drawing. Drawing is a thought form, this indeterminate space where you can find something out. It's like I've been training for this forever. I can't remember a time when I didn't draw. The skill is discipline. I don't know if it's so much about skill as having an ability to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Something about faith in doing it, being comfortable in the moment of doing it. There's a quote from John Berger that I think about. He says, the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Each evening we see the sunset. We know the earth is turning away from it, yet the knowledge, the explanation, never quite fits the sight. The series is called Cloud Falls in Love with Mortal. It starts with an image of a Fatimagana mirage in the sky above Hastings. It's an image I saw in one of the tabloid newspapers. The mirage pulsates in the sky just like a heartbeat. And it looks like it's opening up a portal to another world. It reminded me of a Star Trek episode called Metamorphosis that I'd seen as a child. In this story, the Star Trek story, a cloud falls in love with a spaceman. The cloud yearns for the human, whilst also recognising its own otherness. The question in my head was how to capture something as elusive as a cloud something that doesn't have inherent static form. Throughout this series, I was thinking about mutability, shifting forms, repositioning things. Things are out of order. We look at the world inverted the Fatimagana mirage flips the ocean upside down. One of the drawings is of the sea drawn from memory. It's called All Night I Hear the Water Sobbing. The ocean has sentience I was thinking that a cloud might feel something, a stone might feel something, the ocean might respond 
to my own feeling. I wanted to think of these as entities that might return our gaze rather than simply as things we might impose or inscribe ourselves upon. My cats are always in the studio when I'm drawing. It's a comfortable space for them because I'm focused and concentrating. They like the smell of graphite dust and the sound of my pencil. One day, Bandit was lying across my paper. I could see that he was nose to tail exactly the length of the paper, a metre long. I took measurements directly from him and materialised him on the paper. There was a sense in which this exactitude was a way to pay attention to his creatureliness. It's a strange domestic relationship that you have with animals. People don't really talk about the way you love their little bodies. It's almost sexual. You feel this connection with them that is quite telepathic. In a way, the telepathy that I have with my cats is similar to the telepathy that takes place in drawing. There's a telepathy of hands in the making. You're not very self-aware thinking through your fingertips. There's a sensorial contact, an electricity or perception that pulses through the fingertips. So much of the labour of drawing is hidden. An example is maybe the drawings of book pages that come so close to being facsimiles of the printed text that I'm copying. I think of these copies as small acts of preservation. They have the instability of faked documents. As a viewer, you don't know whether it's an exact copy of the manuscript. Or maybe something else is going on. Sometimes something else is at work. It may be that I've rewritten or redesigned a page to suit my own narrative purposes. When you're looking at a drawing, you can see that it's built up of layers. When I start a work, oftentimes I don't know what will take shape. I'm just covering the paper in graphite over and over again until the surface gives way. Then I'll erase areas. I'll even make a complete drawing, then erase it all. I'll make marks and remake it. In this way, the paper is slowly being eroded, damaged by my looking. There is a tension there that is not unlike the tension you feel when you see an x-ray of a historic painting, where the underdrawing reveals that at some point the artist had quite different intentions than the final piece. Because I work in pencil and paper, it's so easy to erase and make reversals to test different ideas. The form's so light, so portable. There's the possibility that a single piece of paper may be the compression of a year's worth of looking and thinking. Yet, it is essentially almost weightless and so frugal. I like the fact that it takes up 
such a small amount of space in the world. I'm not really conscious of looking when I draw. It's so incredibly embodied that I wouldn't necessarily say I'm actually looking at anything. The gaze is turned inwards. The drawing is a process of spatializing thought. Time passes, marked out in graphite. There's a knowledge that is applied to studying the world through drawing. I'm always trying to represent things that are hard to represent. Often that can be a technical challenge. I'll see something and I'll think, could I draw that? Something as elusive as a cloud or vapour or fog. Could I hold it still? I make notes of ideas, memories, quotes on index cards while I'm working in the studio. I guess they're a kind of marginalia or a series of footnotes to the work. From time to time I arrange the cards under headings that allow me to cross-reference and see different narratives. There's a stream of consciousness quality to these. The connections can be associative, sometimes elliptical or unlikely. Reading them can be strange as I can almost feel the texture of my thinking at a certain time. On a card filed under museums and archives is this quote from Walter Benjamin. Images that, severed from all early associations, reside as treasures in the sober rooms of our later insights, like torsos in a collector's gallery. When I first came across the Niobe group of statues in the Borghese Gardens in Rome, I didn't actually know the myth that's acted out by these casts. There are about 15 statues and they seem to be frozen in a battle or some kind of violent action. It was like coming across the petrified figures in the Witch's Garden in Narnia. This slow, giddy understanding that a story had been stilled or put on pause. According to the Greek myth, Niobe had seven sons and seven daughters, and she boasted of her superiority for this, causing the anger of the twin gods Apollo and Artemis. As a punishment for her pride, Apollo killed all Niobe's sons and Artemis killed all her daughters. The statue of Niobe shows her clutching her youngest daughter as she begs Zeus to turn her to stone. And yet even as a rock, Niobe continues to cry. Love. 